Um, hello, welcome and thank you for joining the, the fourth PE slash event. It's really great to see many familiar faces and, and names. And if you are new to PE slash, I'm welcome again. And a quick introduction of me. I'm Monique Ho. I work at PE Systems Applied Intelligence as a management consultant. I am experienced in um, business analysis, business change, um, cybersecurity, um, particular interested in um, uh, startups, ventures, agile transformation. Today, I'm joined by Alan, another organizing committee of uh, the Sash. Alan, would you like to introduce yourself to? Yep, so uh, like uh, Monique, I'm uh, a BA. I've been in the field probably um, for about 20 odd years, maybe more. Um, been involved in a lot of software development projects, um, leading BA teams. I'm now working in um, the insurance space as a business consultant. Um, so yeah, bit of a bit of a checkered past, but mainly in kind of financial services, uh, and that's where I've kind of learned my BA trade. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Adam. And so in previous events, I share with you some stories why I started BE Slash to offer quality, no cost events. Um, as you know, BE Slash is a community for all, and this is a content focused group. And th therefore, Alan and I have been um, exploring ways to bring up more useful insights to this BE Slash group. Um, is it would be a very good idea to, to get as many of you involved in this because this is your community as well. So we are about to kickstart some research on the market and the trends of business analysis. And we will experiment applying agile to research activities. So if you are interested in knowing more about the, the research that you're about to start, and are wanting to experiment and experience applying Agile to research, which would be very, very relevant for many of uh, research tasks at work, um, do contact us. And as usual, uh, spread the words with your contacts, tweet us, um, follow us on, on LinkedIn and, and on YouTube, just to make us visible um, to, to more fellows out there and they can join us to form a stronger community together. A few housekeeping points. So you will receive the, the slide back today as well as the recording in a couple of days. Um, your line is muted now because we are doing a recording. So feel free to unmute your line at the, the end of the, the section when we do the Q&A later. You can also put your questions in the, the chat box where Ellen will collate um, and ask the questions towards the end. Last but as important, thank you for those who have put some questions on, on Slido already, and we, we will incorporate them um, in this section. And you are very welcome to stay behind for some great old discussions on various topics and basically e meet um, different people and network and, and social. Today's topic is about SAFE, so um, the um, scale agile work. So let's do a quick poll to see the exposure of our, our audience to, to save. So Alan is bringing up the, the screen of the, the poll for everyone to... Yeah, that's great, thank you. So uh, just to check how, how, how safe are you? So uh, you are a newbie to uh, the SAFE framework or have you been practicing it or actually I'm an expert of, of SAFE? So just, just get, get to know that. So while we are getting the, the poll, um, so um, today um, is really our, our pressure to have Dan to, to join us. So um, Daniel, he, he is a colleague of mine at BAE. Uh, just happened that we never were on the same projects before. Maybe we were just hiding from, from one another, but we, we crossed paths quite a, quite a bit on different um, digital business analysis events and, and training at BAE. So, um, so Dan today will walk us through some fundamental concepts of SAFE and also he will share his experience of, um, of how he applied um, his BA skills on his projects. So yeah, so how are we doing with the, the poll? So, so let's have a look. Wow. So we've got um, 29 votes mm. and uh, 
looks like we're all pretty unsafe. Although we have got uh, a few uh, a few people that are doing framework. So uh, right. hopefully that will help you, Dan, as we uh, as we go through. Yeah, that's good. Cool. So yeah, so without further further ado, I'll hand over to you to Dan to, to share with us the topic. Thank you, Monique. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Hopefully that will work. Can everybody see my screen? Cool. Yeah. Right. Um, thanks very much for joining everybody. My name is Dan Misko. I am a business analyst working uh, for BAE and I have been working in SAFE for the last year or so, but before that I was working as an agile business analyst uh, for the last sort of seven years across several different sectors. Um, charities, financial sector, and um, public sector. So I wanted to deliver this um, presentation. Um, I'm aware that quite a lot of business analysts are aware of SAFE, but not really sure how that would impact their work and what the differences are uh, when the business analysis role, um, which isn't actually present in SAFE and how you might adapt business change skills to be able to help in a program uh, through product ownership and what the key differences are. Um, so without further ado, I will start. The agenda of what I'm going to go through, I'm going to set some context. Uh, we didn't do a poll about whether or not people have heard of Agile, I assume that everybody has. But how does Agile differ from SAFE? Um, and a little bit of background around SAFE, but to be honest, if you are going to go into a SAFE program, I would say that the first thing on your list of things to do would be to get training uh, at the appropriate level for your experience around what you'll be doing and how you'll be doing it. Um, some of SAFE is very prescribed, but what I'm actually going to be doing is what isn't prescribed based on my experience, based on coming into it as a business analyst. Um, I will talk about how a product owner aligns their work to the SAFE program increment cadence. Um, I will go through that in a little bit more detail in a second. Um, and one of the key concepts I think that is different for a business analyst in SAFE is the concept of doing just enough collaboration to facilitate prioritization and make the right calls. So a little bit of context about where I work and what I do. I would say as working in public sector, they're generally quite large organizations with quite a lot of legacy applications. They are primarily service and operations based clients who have a poor to average technology delivery understanding. So anytime we engage with them, there is quite a long period of getting them to understand that um, we can't give them everything that they want. They generally work um, with quite hard deadlines, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can service the deadline or deliver everything that we need, uh, they, they ask for. Um, there is fairly low stability of requirements for those reasons. So quite a lot of the work that goes in initially around elaboration is to establish who actually is going to be making decisions and what are they at the right level of seniority? And I would say that they're complicated on the requirement side, but not necessarily very complicated on the technical side. We mainly use known and um, easily understood technologies or COTS products. So just to contrast agile versus safe, if anybody's familiar with Agile, it always talks about the sort of sanctity of a, an individual team. Um, we've worked primarily with Scrum, so you have a concept of a Scrum team which has um, engineers that are testers, developers, uh, you might have technical leadership within the team, architectural support, and a product owner, and a Scrum master, and safe works across multiple teams. And one of the key reasons why it needs to work across multiple teams is that it 
accept the idea that there are dependencies between teams who are working towards the same goals. So one of the key things that SAFE offers organizations is some degree of predictability um, further ahead. The predictability of an agile team is based on you having a consistent burn down and you having done enough elaboration up front for you to be able to size things. Personally, I found that agile teams are pretty reticent about sizing anything that's too far ahead of time, but SAFE at least gives them the time and the framework to um, do that without um, feeling burdened by the um, estimate and putting in extra contingency which ends up being wrong. So the SAFE frame framework works on program increments. If I lapse into um, native language and say PI, that's what I mean, it's a program increment which is a series of five sprints um, in most of the ways that it is elaborated. So that will be uh, five Ten, uh, five two-week sprints over 10 weeks. The deliverables that are discussed in the, for an agile team are stories, whereas the deliverables for a safe program are features or enablers, which have to be completed within a PI. So I thought that it might be interesting to, to just say, um, maybe you are, interested in developing your career and working in safe environments or perhaps your organization is going to go uh, and into a safe transition and i just want to say like what's in it for you um, or what am i in for if you're not as um, happy about going into it so i would say that in terms of the way that you work if you were a product owner within an agile team before you will start to experience, you'll start to be involved in broader, higher level elicitation um, using classic BA skills uh, for, for elicitation and elaboration. Using the just enough elaboration skills, which I'll go on to later, you will be involved in far more strategic prioritization decisions if you are involved in um, the product management which is the sort of elevated uh, level of product ownership you will have quite a high level of scope stability for your features um, so you won't be constantly looking to see whether or not a change in stories is going to push out what you're going to do and you need to do reprioritization of your team backlog because it should be encompassed by what is um, estimated by the features. There will be greater inter-team collaboration um, and dependency management. Uh, so generally you and the Scrum Master will be working on that. I'd say another positive is that in general, I've seen that there's been less wasted elaboration effort so that would be effort to elaborate something that just sits on the backlog and sits there and sits there and never gets prioritized. Um, there are several sort of stage gates that you go through in SAFE that sh should mean that that is never prioritized for elaboration. Um, I've used the term vanity features. I don't think that's official, but vanity features for me is something that's sponsored by somebody who is um, not necessarily just that they're important, but they might have a very clear idea of what they want and clarity is king um, if you can describe what you need or what you want um, quite often in an agile sense it will get prioritized above something because it's ready rather than because it's the right thing to do um, i would also say that there's a potential for less rework which is um, good for just general efficiency so if anybody has gone on to the um, scaled agile framework uh, website um, they might have seen the big picture this is a this is the essential or sort of program level version of the safe 
um, and it's where you start uh, your it's where you start your training essentially if you if you're not at the right scale to do this then you don't even start um, the overhead of running safe is too high for you to um, take it on unless you're in a group of probably five or so teams um, probably it those teams are going to be relatively stable. They're going to be ongoing for probably a year. Um, you go into something which is called an agile release train, uh, which is basically the coordinated group of several delivery teams. And I'm going to be talking particularly about the product ownership within agile teams um, and their interface with the product management uh, which is where I think the VA skills are most relevant. I would also say that, um, so personally, um, a bit of history, we started um, our first PI um, in September last year. Um, we've gone through several iterations since then. I would say that uh, we were getting quite good at what we were doing after about three so after about 30 weeks or 20 weeks experience of planning and then covid happened and we had to relearn how to do that in a remote environment um, but i will try and share some ideas about how that can be done um, there's a whole load of literature about pi planning and i'll go into uh, that in a little bit of detail later so this is just a little bit more of background about what a program increment is. Um, the major input into a program increment from the planning side is a program increment board. I'm going to go through what that is in a second. The program increment itself, you have a plan, do, check, adjust, cycle for each of your um, sprints, which is represented by your um, sprint retrospectives and you basically this is just explaining that you also do the same at an increment level so for those that haven't seen it this is a program board I think that this quote encapsulates things quite well that plans are nothing and planning is everything planning normally takes place over a couple of days ideally you'd all be co-located it is all of the teams all of their stakeholders um, that could feed into how something is um, is to be built or how it's to be prioritized this shows individual features in blue so you can have a feature that has no dependencies you can start it whenever you want you can deliver it whenever you want or you can have features that are all building towards a significant milestone so all of the ones in red have traceability to one another. You might be dependent upon all of them to be able to start a new feature um, and before you eventually get to completing your larger piece of work. So this is a program Kanban, which is a description of what work you are going to be doing and it is at a feature level a feature will contain many stories and i want to dwell on the elaboration activities prior to pi planning because that is going to be where business analysts are going to be most involved you have um, something that they call the funnel Everyone and anyone that has an idea for a piece of work um, that can fit into a program increment or several um, features that would fit into a program increment completes uh, some basically a mini business case for them to do the work. Then there is a stage gate where you review that with product management who looks at the relative um, merits of each of the features and takes it into an analyzing column 
which is where business analysts or product owners are typically tasked with doing enough analysis to be able to establish whether or not it is um, a valuable piece of work. They'll write a benefits hypothesis, who is this actually for? They'll write some acceptance criteria that will bound the scope. Calculate the weighted shortest job first, so that's that WSJF. Um, there's quite a lot of literature about that concept. Um, within public sector, we've had to basically hack this and come up with several criteria that are important to our clients and basically do a pairwise comparison between each of the features that are up for uh, going onto the backlog to relatively score um, against how much effort it takes to it would take to actually deliver the um, functionality, whether or not they are worth doing. And once you get to that point and you have a set of completely elaborated features that have a benefits hypothesis, acceptance criteria, and a size, then the top ones that will fit into the rough capacity of the art will be taken into the backlog, approved by project management, uh, uh, product management, and there will be continuous prioritization um, as they, if they are elaborated any further. I'd say that once you get to that point, you've finished the classical business analysis, elaboration, uh, elicitation, elaboration, and sort of definition of requirements in a safe context. The implementing phase is where the um, product owner oversees the definition, uh, the work that the development teams do to decompose each of these features into stories that will satisfy the acceptance criteria. And after that point, I generally business analysts don't get involved in the um, validating the deployment. Um, possibly at the releasing stage, they might get involved in reviewing the benefits and evaluating whether or not they were completed. And then once it's done, you're on to the next phase. So there was a question about traceability within SAFE. So the way that the, the structure of SAFE is that you go from a portfolio epic to a program levels of features, and then to team levels of user stories. Above that, it really depends on your organization. So OKR is something that our client has introduced, which is the objectives and key results. Uh, they are also using the strategic themes that they have, and that that's the way that they've organized what they're doing. And I would say that that is roughly how, how you get traceability from the major work that the client is undertaking to transform their business, get split into multiple programs, and then those programs deprecated into features, into user stories, and then delivered. Uh, there's an example there of something on the right hand side, which is a feature that could be generated from within the um, within the art. That could be a operational feature or a architectural feature that would deliver benefit to the art, but it wouldn't necessarily be aligned to a OK OKR in and of itself. So, what is the concept of just enough elaboration? The very high level areas that you want to satisfy in doing just enough elaboration requires quite a lot of collaboration within the art. You have your capability alignment as I spoke about just a moment ago. Then you're defining the business analysis, uh, business benefit, and that normally comes from uh, whoever 
sort of sponsored the feature or sponsored the program that this came from. Safe recommends using a four who is a unlike our solution format, which I find quite useful. Four bounds the users that will be affected by the change. Who describes their current role. Is a will be like the, the generic type of role and what they what they're trying to achieve. Unlike could be if you're moving from something that is not there at all, you could say that unlike the current situation or unlike um, if you were proposing to a sustained piece of work, you could say unlike not doing anything, um, our solution will ensure that um, users can do these things or that a system will not move out of support. High level acceptance criteria I think is basically at the level of the what a classic sort of business requirements catalog would would discuss. You're bounding at a very high level what this feature actually means. Technical steps would be between you, the architect, and the delivery team would determine a a basic plan for what you would need to do in terms of the components you would need to create or change in order to be able to do the work. Guardrails might be something within your organization you have to use a certain technology or you have to use you have to comply to certain standards and that's just defined by the architecture and the size as we discussed before. So to give a bit of context, I would say working on the basis that, um, I'll just skip forward one slide. So the, to get the, the funnel features all developed, they could be all brand new, but you would have quite a few that might have been there from, um, from previous uh, rounds of elaboration. The funnel features are finalized two or three weeks into the new um, program increment. Within another two weeks, the first pass through the features is actually completed. So at that point, you have to complete the just enough elaboration on each of these features and that if you're if you think that what you're probably working on is 10 weeks work for um, one possibly a couple of delivery teams you might get overawed that you are doing a hell of a lot of elaboration in a very short period of time but that is really hopefully gets to the heart of what just enough elaboration means it is just enough for the delivery teams to be able to understand something at a high level and then take it into the program increment planning in order to be able to um, break it down um, much further So you work to constrain the acceptance criteria as quickly as possible. Um, once you get into PI planning, you also um, facilitate some decision about business value for each of the features. You do the sizing for weighted shortest job first. If that changes during PI planning, that's fine. Uh, you might reassess or reprioritize at that point. And you also try to limit the work in progress at every stage so that you can elaborate enough and the teams do have enough work to uh, review. And like I said, in terms of the time frame, after you've done, once you're working on the assessment and the analysis, the work is reassessed, the backlog is 
completed. Then there will be a, a product management level. There might be some uh, setting of expectations in terms of how much work will be done. When you've done the sizing, you will probably have a reasonable idea of capacity of your art, um, and you will know whether or not your program backlog is too long. Um, personally, we've found that one of the biggest problems that we had when we started um, running SAFE was that we were taking in about 150% of what the capacity of the world was. So immediately after PI planning, everybody was quite happy. They had um, they had made good plans that they could that they felt that they could do, but there were these things that we there were another 50% of the features at the bottom of the program backlog that were all judged to be valuable that see that um, stakeholders assumed were going to be done in the next increment were not done um, and weren't going to be done uh, which led to some quite awkward conversations but that's part of how you work through it in practice I don't think that's any different to disappointing people through agile but you probably disappoint them earlier and actually get a bit more realistic buy-in in into um, constraining scope. Um, I think having features that last within a PI is, is really good because you end up in a situation where uh, with Agile, I certainly ended up with epics that lasted several sprints um, and if you wanted to make any changes, you tended to put another story into the epic rather than just saying, no, this is a line in the sand, I'm not going to do any more. Um, I found that quite difficult to defend. Well, this was just some advice that if you were the best time to go for a holiday in the safe cycle is right after PI planning. Uh, trust me, you'll be quite knackered. And the benefits of going away then is that most of the uh, burden on creating new or funnel features and re feature requests goes to the business um, so you don't necessarily need to be that involved in elaboration activity at that point in the cycle and the team also have a really good understanding of what they're going to be doing for the first one or two sprints so that's um, also useful um, another personal experience um, we have ended up, for whatever reason, um, doing our PI planning quite close to Christmas um, in January, um, and that did not work very well. Um, basically, in terms of your elaboration effort, you need to make, make sure that everybody that you need to speak to to do the elaboration is available. And once you're stuck in this cadence, um, you need to basically work within that 10 week period. It might mean that you even do some work for subsequent PIs that you wouldn't uh, have normally done that early. Um, and also, yeah, our next PI is in August, which again is going to suffer from the same sort of problem. So two things to be aware of. Um, I was going to, I can pass back to Monique if there are any questions. I haven't been looking at the chat. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, that's, um, I think, it's a, it's a great topic because it's huge and there are lots of materials online. And I think up there, there were some links that you, um, uh, you suggest to um, uh, fellows here who are a little bit unsafe to, to check them out. So I think that that's good to basically get hold of uh, maybe more of the, the basic concept. So I think it's really good sharing. Kind of you, you mentioned the, uh, the agile versus have safe and like as a BA, maybe we get more involved in the, the hypothesis and all that. So, yeah. so um, I, I actually saw quite a lot of questions on the, the chat box. So Alan, would you be able to, to walk Yes, um, there's, there's been uh, good activity on uh, on chat and there are uh, quite a few questions um <clears throat> quite a few of them are around um the uh the dependencies and um 
how um, kind of make sure that you're involved in all those dependencies with you know, Scrum of Scrums, etc. So I think the first question um, relates to your um, slide where you um, compare um, safe and agile. Yep. And we've got a question from Yaz, which uh, he'd just like you to um, basically explain what you mean here that um, agile rejects dependencies, whereas uh, uh, safe uh, accepts them. Yes. So this is was uh, possibly my uh, agile teams have been more militant about this but they would never take in a story into a sprint if there was anything dependent um, that they had any dependencies that meant that they could or could not satisfy that those stories that's what I meant does that make sense? Okay. Whereas, um, whereas over a two or three month period, um, you basically write out. So it doesn't it doesn't mean that an agile um, project rejects all dependencies. It means that in the planning cycle of a sprint, I have never taken in any dependencies. In a program increment over five sprints, I have accepted that there will some, be some dependencies that need to be planned in for. That's what I meant. Okay, um, yeah, I, I've just, okay, maybe I've not seen it articulated that way, but in my experience of Agile, um, dependencies are not a problem. I mean, when, when you're creating your acceptance criteria, uh, you know, the given when then, yep. the given portion of, of the acceptance criteria is your dependency so given this that and the other then okay. the, the user takes this action the the system reacts in this particular way so in terms of dependencies i mean it's more it's like in order to deliver this story we need a and other team to give us infrastructure or we need another team to um complete their piece of work before we can do this piece of work again um, uh, in my experience when when I used to be a BA now I'm a scrum master and, and the way I usually run my teams if I've got multiple teams then the teams are working on user stories any any issues that come come out of um, each team particularly when we're doing the three amigos the the, the collaborative uh, refinement sessions any dependencies that come out of that I've got another team that are running Kanban that I'm putting user stories in into into the backlog and they pick them off depending on how I prioritize them so if I've got one team who needs a particular bit of infrastructure I've got another team that's um, ready to, to, to pick that up put the infrastructure together ready for the team to um, do their development on it, I, I don't really see it as, as rejecting dependencies it, it, it absorbs them it depends on how you run them um, so I, I just take a little bit of an issue with 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 that that statement um, and I don't yep. think safe and I've used I, I, I'm one of the ones that said yep I've used safe uh, quite frequently um, I, I, I don't really see what benefit safe gives us as far as that particular part is concerned um, yeah, I think that it yes, sounds. I think that's really interesting. It's cat here, um, because I would honestly say that safe um, surfaces all those dependencies. It gives them visibility, and then you've got the right people. You need to have the right people in your PI planning that then are able to help um, facilitate and manage those dependencies. So for me, you know, I, I, as a broad statement, this is fairly accurate. I would, I would also add, um, Yaz, and this is not meant as a contradiction, I would not say that within your scope of control, your, your um, as Scrum Master of multiple teams, I don't think that there's anything, there's any such thing as a dependency 
within a world that you don't manage yourself anyway. In, a, in Agile, you, you manage all of those dependencies as part of the way that you work already. So when I talk about dependencies, I tend to mean dependencies that are external to what you can work on, that you have to bring in people to satisfy. Sure, you, and you use the example of maybe some infrastructure that's that, that's that's um, you know likely required. You know whether you need you need load balancers in 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 place or you know that or, or redundant systems and so on and so forth. Um, but cat cat is it? Um, I think. Um, while safe does identify dependencies um, in advance, I think it only identifies potential dependencies. You don't know what those actual dependencies are until you actually hit it, and that's and, and that's where agile is is actually um, I, I think is 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 geared up to actually deal with those kind of things. But it also depends on how how you apply agile. It's not. It's not just the case of you know um, you, you do you do your five stand, you know your stand ups every day and your um, retrospective at the end of the the sprint and all that kind of lovely stuff. It does it does actually require some so a little bit of thought. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. I think that's that's a really good point. Is that you know the environments that you're working in um, have a, a real effect on how how well you can deal with those sort of things. Um, you know, and I think one of the uh, the drivers behind SAFE was to kind of bring Agile into a much more uh, corporate environment because I think it's, it's had uh, a bit of a, a kind of a bad rap in terms of it's a shortcut uh, and we all know that um, you know Agile isn't a shortcut necessarily it just helps you get to somewhere quicker. Um, I mean I have my own views as to why SAFE um, actually came came about and, and I think it's as you say it is to get it into the corporate environment yeah I think now, I'm is, just gonna just gonna stop you there Yaz because we've got a lot of, uh, of questions to get through this sounds like something that we could bring into uh, the chat afterwards um, so I'll just kind of try and pick up uh, some no questions worries, from, I'll, I'll shut up. <laughs> from people that perhaps haven't had as much experience from uh, a safe perspective so um, we've got a, a question here um, that says, um, who, who would you expect to break down features into stories? Um, is this not the BA and if not, why not? Um, it, would, it would depend upon the story. Um, we, we often find that actually in terms of the So it's business analysts are very good at supplying user facing and business rule type acceptance criteria, but they don't necessarily define technical acceptance criteria. Um, that might be about um, sequences of particular components and some of that sort of thing, which I see quite a lot in our acceptance criteria in stories. Um, so that was why, and, and SAFE recommends that it is the development team's responsibility, which would include the product owner to a certain extent doing the um, deprecation. But that was the, that's my explanation for, um, for that. It'll be a collaborative effort between the development team and the product owner or business analyst to make sure that the acceptance criteria ultimately fulfills the feature acceptance criteria. Great, and, and I think the last one is, is probably an unfair question really. Uh, what are the biggest challenges in persuading a team to change from agile to safe? I think it depends on your team. Um, I would say that it, um, what do they get out of it? It would be probably that, like I've put at the bottom, you don't get features that are not going to be very well used. And you, you don't, um, so, so they don't waste effort. There is a lot more sort of, there is a bit more effort in terms of 
them um, being involved in safe ceremonies. And if um, anybody has ever tried to sell the idea of basically two days of uh, a backlog refinement session to a group of developers, uh, they would um, also know that that would be highly uncomfortable as well as doing t-shirt sizing for quite large pieces of work. Generally, if a team has worked in agile, um, it doesn't work. What I would say is if you are going to do that um, on the safe website, there is something about doing the safe roadmap. And I would say that the, one of the key things to do is make sure that your team are trained so that they understand what they're in store for. Um, otherwise it's going to be a nasty shock. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, we've got uh, a, a quick poll um, just, uh, just really to uh, get some feedback on um, our, our event tonight. And then um, we'll run uh, a little bit of kind of networking after this. Um, so I'm just going to launch this poll before we lose everyone. Um, so if we can just have a quick, uh, quick answer to this, then um, that would be really great. Ooh, and while we are doing the other poll, um, so what's next? So the, the next event, uh, we, we have got it, gotten it down um, as the uh, 19th of um, August or next month. Um, so we have gotten a topic about stakeholder management and engagement for an, a social enterprise. And there are lots more that, that will be transferable for a corporate world as well. And we are uh, basically working out the format of the event. Uh, we want it to be uh, more interactive for people to reflect on uh, what the speaker said and also to, to get involved in conversation that you can also speak to other fellows on like what's your experience in uh, on the topic. Um, and kind of, um, kind of final, the last few slides. So yeah, do stay connected um, by joining this event. You, you will be receiving our newsletter about our, our next event and all these, but do kind of follow us on, on LinkedIn, YouTube, and share um, the, the group with your um, contacts as well. Um, really kind of get involved because it's a, a community for, for everyone. It's not just um, Monique and, and Alan running it. So. Um, Get in touch if you want to be uh, an organizer, you want to experiment the, the research using um, Agile, or you, you have some recommendation on speakers, topics, um, some charities to recommend us to reach out to, um, do um, let us know. And yeah, so we'll, we'll leave it there. And for, for those of you uh, who are interested in um, staying behind for our breakout session, do uh, stay on the line and then we'll um, basically sort out the logistics for, for that. Yeah, but thank you very much for, for joining the event. It's, it's lovely to, to have discussion and see how, how, how people are getting on with their things and have to and also thank you Dan for, for sharing the topic to uh, get some introduction of um, SAFE to lots of the BAs and then uh, maybe that will prompt um, some further reading and research on the topic as well. But yeah. That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much all. And I'll, I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you very much.